Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to my world. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer, the greatest professional wrestler of all time, your friend and mine, Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Jeff, how are you, man? Oh, Connie, to tell you the truth, uh, before we hit play, I kind of went into it. I'm a little out of sorts today, my man. It's hotter than Hades outside, but my chair, um, folks that, uh, Cannot see uh, or, or not watching. If you just listen to this, if my voice kind of trails off uh, in and out of this podcast, it's because the the spring in my chair has um, it finally tapped. It's had a hell of a run dating back to 2002, but the spring. So sometimes when I lean back, kind of goes like this, Conrad. But other than that, boy, what a week! What a month we have coming up! Wait, 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 wait. You said that chair has been in service since O two. Uh, so that's a, tw- you've, you've had that chair for more than 22 years. Technically speaking. Um, yep. <laughs> so February, maybe February, maybe March. Um, and, that- and kind of like the routing that it's gone because, um, uh, bought it. <laughs> You're going to think I'm nuts, but I remember this, this knowledge. Bought it, obviously brought it to my house, worked out of my house for a couple of months. Then we moved up um, Johnny Cash Parkway, the first offices of TNA. Uh, moved into that office, went from there down to uh, Coming Station in Nashville. It had a run in the Coming Station building from, what would that mean? Maybe 03 to, oh, it left cr- Christmas of um, 2013. Um. Did I take this to the to the anthem offices? Yeah, I, I believe I did, and then it came back from here. And uh, it's um, Connie, um, our man, your friend, Mister Dave Silva, squoz, squoz, squeezed into this chair as he was setting up my podcast headquarters. So yeah, we got twenty. That's hard to believe. Twenty two years and counting, but I believe. Um. Hang on, hang on. Uh, you started TNA in that chair. Yes. Jill was still with us with that chair. I I, I have a feeling that uh, she she was m- maybe a witness to this purchase. I make the decision. I made all the decisions, but I said yes. Cody, true, true. that chair's older than Cody. Oh, here we go with this. You've <laughs> you've known that chair longer than you've known Karen. <laughs> You have you that's the longest running relationship, physical relationship in your life is that chair. Think of all the bad creative you and Vince Russo came up with personally in that chair. X Division, that chair. King of the Mountain match, that chair. Oh. Sign and Sting, that chair. Almost getting Hulg- Hogan, that chair. The conversations that I've had, uh legal conversations, because Conrad. I've, I'll pull the microphone with me because when I'm in a real deep one and I know it's serious, I got to lean back and I put both hands behind my back and I'm thinking And many a time Karen has walked in or even a daughter's walked in and I am on the phone, but just like in this position, eyes closed. They just come in, turn around, you turn and walk right back out. Yeah. I, the longest, did you just call this the longest physical relationship? Yeah. Of your entire life. <laughs> I'm just saying that thing has supported you through thick and thin, the ups, the downs, all the protein. Um, we'll just let it go. <laughs> Can you imagine? My God, you know what we got to do though. If that chair is, is really being put out to pasture. Hey buddy, I am putting it in. Uh, I don't know if the dumpster trash. No, no, up. no, no, no. We're going to use that to raise some money for some sort of charity. Here we go. I mean, that, that's last outlaw farts in there. That's king of the mountain farts in there. <laughs> Think about all the bad creative that has oh. come out, all the great stuff. When you made a deal oh. to bring the new Japan wrestle kingdom show to America in English with Jr., it was in that chair. True story. That's true. I'm just saying when you're first pitching me on the idea of what if we did Starcast on pay-per-view with fight, it was in that chair or sure in this chair, all those podcasts signing with, uh, AEW signing with WWE. Yep. I mean, it's all in that chair. There's a lot of history in that chair and you too can have Jeff Jarrett farts of your own. We were <laughs> gonna, in your own home. We should get that thing in the Smithsonian 
But if, 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 if that's what the new owner wants to do with it, cause we will be setting up some sort of an auction site. We're going to raise money for charity. What will we call that? Is that a king of the mountain? Yeah. Maybe that's the king of the mountain chair. It's that's your throne. throne. Yes. <laughs> we landed in the same spot. That's a good sign. Uh, only, only you Connie, uh, if we're going to have some good, uh, reads today, I, God bless you. If we have uh, manscaped today. Oh, we do. We got manscaped and blue chew. So it's going to be fun, but. Uh, Hey, I want to talk about a lot of fun stuff. First of all, shoes, baseball is knee deep. And if you haven't already check it out, shoesbaseball.com. There's something for everybody. It's fun for the whole family. If you've been missing out, I recommend you check it out. I mean, first of all, it's affordable family fun. And right now it's just a good time of year to go something about a stadium dog and something about spending time with the fam outside watching a game. It's fun. I recommend it. And they keep it fun with all the little shoulder events and fun activities. Every night's a something. It's, you're, it's, it's going to be fun for the whole family at shoesbaseball.com. And this weekend, it's a big pay-per-view. Forbidden Door is back. AEW always over delivers on pay-per-view. This Sunday will not be the exception. It will be the rule. Another badass AEW New Japan Pro Wrestling joint production. It's going down this Sunday, June 30th, live on pay-per-view. I'll be watching on Triller TV, and I hope you will be as well. If you are in the area, though, tickets are on sale. Still a handful of tickets remain, aewtix.com. And that's all happening this Sunday. But, Jeff, you caught the internet by storm this past week. Oh, boy. I, um, I loved the promo. I started getting lots of texts and tags on Saturday night. We, we got about a minute and a half version of the promo on collision on this weekend. But then I saw where someone said, Hey, they've got the full unedited cut over on the AEW YouTube. And we've got that linked in the description for today's show. So if you haven't seen it already, wherever you're enjoying podcasts, we'll have a link there. So you can see the full nine minute video, but Jeff, it was, um, it was amazing. It's gotten universal praise from Dave Meltzer, from Sean Ross Sapp, and everyone in, I mean, every luminary, every talking head says, this is incredible. And I think what people love and the reason it resonates, Jeff, is because it wasn't a promo. It was just you talking. It was your heart. It was your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions. You, were, you allowed yourself to be vulnerable, which is why I enjoy doing this podcast with you. But man, it was just incredible. Uh, Tell us about how that came to be and and what the feedback you've gotten has been. (sighs) Connie, we were just laughing at where my uh, emotions uh, on my sleeve. Um, I I was actually fully prepared to 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 kind of talk. uh, I'll just say high level. the, the chair situation started off. I mean, Conrad, every, uh, literally every time. Um, well, I'll tell you a little story behind the story. So last Wednesday um, at Dynamite was at George Mason University, and that is the home of Sanjay Dutt. He literally grew up uh, 10 minutes from the arena. Uh, he met his, uh, went, uh, you know, went to high school in that area. He met his wife, Ashley. Uh, at George Mason, they graduated from there. So a lot of history. So uh, we went up last week um, and we were in a true dark match. Uh, me and Jay um, had a hell of a time. We put Sanjay up on our shoulders afterwards because, you know, it was a cool kind of home uh, homecoming kind of feeling with his wife and kids and all that kind of good stuff. But, you know, um, the the real reason I went up there or a second or the main reason that's a better way to phrase it is, uh, to do, to do, kind of, I got it to do the interview. Uh, it was kind of, I guess, uh, formally, and there had been talk off and on, um, Conrad, I don't know for, for how deep the conversations got, but I believe there was conversations last year about it. I don't know how far they went. It wasn't none of my business. Um, you know, there, there's a, uh, real joy in my life, Conrad. And we've talked about this off air that, you know, when you're not in that creative process, um, it, cause I was in it or in and out of it for so long. And if it goes well, the talent gets the credit. If it goes bad, um, the, the creative process, uh, gets all the blame and that's just the reality of it. But last year I was not a part of it. Um, the the tournament and that, that was cool. And then this year, 
you know, there was a little bit, a little bit, I'll say a little bit of chatter off and on about it. Uh, and then I guess as kind of the layers went down and in a way, when I heard that the stakes, the stipulations, the winner moves on to Wembley, Conrad, I immediately said, all right, that eliminates me. And that, and I get it. I mean, uh, there's anybody listening to this show, me, you, we, we all know, uh, for, for the most part, my journey, uh, and everything that goes with it, the good, the bad, the ugly, the up and the down and everything, you know? So, so I just went, okay, those eight guys, um, got to have an appendage to Wimbledon. Um, and then Conrad, I had that thought. I'm like, that tournament is my win. Um, but the decision was made to put me in. And so, uh, last Wednesday it kicked off, uh, with Pac and Claudio and, uh, they wanted me to, to sit down and really just answer one question. What's it mean to me? Um, so me and Karen were at catering and, uh, with Jay and just sitting there talking and I was doing, I'll call it my day job, uh, you know, my, my business development job. So I was in and out of different production rooms and moving and all that, but I ran upstairs to get a bite to eat. And then they said, Hey, we're, we're going to try to schedule this later in the night, blah, blah, blah. You know, w- what time works for you. And then, uh, they let us know, okay, we're going to do the dark match before the show starts, and that's for Sanjay and all that. So had a blast doing that. Um, and then afterwards came through, and they said, hey, when you get cleaned up, let's go do it. And Karen said something to the effect, guys, it's the only thing that he cries about every time. Uh, man. It, uh, whew, see, I mean, <clears throat> and I've kind of asked myself, you know, just why is that? And I think, uh, and I text Sanjay this, um, I guess that would have been late Friday night. And he said, Hey, are you okay? If we release the extended version or the uncut version. And I'm like, Hey man, not at all. And, um, and then, uh, Zane, uh, the, the, the Zane, awesome dude, man, I'll, 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 as a human, he's awesome, but shot it, edited it, produced it. Um, you know, he was very complimentary of, because when we got home, uh, Thursday morning, you know, Karen went right to work and sent some pictures and. D- different things. And, you know, from a production standpoint, I told Karen, I said, Hey, give them what is what they, as much as we, we, we can or what they want. So that, that got done. So they were very appreciative. I, I guess you could say of the efforts. And I'm thinking, you know, I, and this is where I'm kind of going with this kind of uh, part of the story is, and I told them, uh, Zane and Sanjay, it's like, Hey guys, this may sound a little wacky, a little corny, but it helps me um, so I appreciate the opportunity. It helps me more than it helps you J- just the opportunity to get it out because as I've learned and man, I feel like a freaking, uh, um, you know, stuffing that for 18 years, uh, is the lesson for me, um, uh, th- that I can hopefully, um, offer up everyone, uh, can take it, uh, at their own pace or, or, or not, uh, is that man, when you, when you really stuff feelings down and don't feel it, don't grieve it, don't think about it, don't process it, don't talk about it one way or another, it's going to come out. It, it just, it, it is, there's, you, you can slice it and dice it all you want. And, and, you know, just the, 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 the when I sat down in that chair, Conrad, I mean, it was like, it was it, it was as if the first time they said, "Hey, man, we're thinking about putting you in the Owen tournament," and it kind of struck me. I'm like, "This time it's 2023." I'm like, "Can you?" I mean, that is that's that's like you can't write this story. You know, if you would have told Jeff sitting in that chair the day after Monday Night Raw, 23, 24 years later, 
hey, you're going to be in a tournament for another promotion, and it's going to be the Owen Hart Foundation tournament, and you're going to be in it. Karen and Cody Saturday night in Cleveland played the, 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 the lotto, and, and I would have told you I got a better chance of winning the lotto if that happened. It just doesn't make sense on, on any level. But, but here we are in 2024 um, with the, the circumstances and, and the realities and them sitting me down and saying, what are your thoughts? And me, again, um, really having the opportunity to, to process it all. Um, I'm grateful for it. Not easy. It's painful at times. <sighs> um, but, you know, it is my opportunity to talk about him, to talk about Owen, and and just, you know, I had this thought uh, over the weekend that, and I hope this, Conrad, you always kind of help rough out the edges, but, you know, when I, when, I, when I think about everything that went with, you know, out of all the people that were a part of that show that night in May of 99, the one individual that I think would have been a uni unanimous decision. No, no, no. He, uh, Owen, nobody deserves to pay, you know, have a work accident and pass away, but of all people. And I think that's one of the things that I've wrestled with. Why him? Um, you know, why Owen? Why? And I've said that in the interview in the uncut version. You know, we, we both call, you know, bought our, at the time, what you'd call, and I'm very grateful, the dream home. Um, I got to move in mine. He didn't. Um, I, I got to live on with life. His was cut short. And, and, and just all that emotion just came up, and, and I really am. I, I, I look at this, and yes, it's professional wrestling, but, but the, the business that I've given my life to is that I get to actually participate in a professional wrestling event 25 years later that honors my friend Owen. That's special to me. It's special to everyone who saw the interview because we can tell how much it means to you. And I think that's the reason everyone has gravitated to this interview. I struggle to even use the word promo because although it is to promote a match and to promote a tournament, it feels so much bigger than that. And calling it a promo feels like maybe it's disingenuous. And I know that it's not. And I, everyone listening to this is so far in the bubble. They know what I mean when I say, you know, we know we're all sort of in on the gag of professional wrestling. We know the bit, but, but that was real. And that's, that is real. That's real life. And that's the reason people gravitate to it. And I've seen a lot of people who are now saying, Jeff has to win the thing like the Owen tournament. Certainly there's stakes now where the winner gets a title shot and that's been decided by Martha and Tony Khan. And that's cool. And maybe there's a lot of people who think that, Oh, well, Jeff Jarrett shouldn't get a title shot in 2024. I would challenge you to say, let's let everybody else tell their motivation and their story and why this matters to them. And see how we feel. I think you very much deserve that opportunity. And it's interesting because as we're sitting here to record, we don't even know who your opponent is going to be in round one. It's Claudio and Pac. It's Danielson and Shingo. It's Ray Phoenix and Jay White. And then Jeff Jarrett and Wildcard. And there's been lots of speculation about who that opponent is. But I've seen a lot of people who say, boy, if Jeff doesn't win the thing, it's a, it's a lost opportunity. That had to make you feel good that in an effort to try to pay homage to Owen Hart, there's a whole lot of people who are now pulling for you and your story. I just, when, when man, when wrestling's good, there ain't nothing better. And that's the best thing I've seen in wrestling this year. So thank you mm -hmm. for that. Wow. Um, back on your comment <laughs> and I'll get, uh, and I, if, 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 you know, your, 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 sounds like your phone blew up and, and, and the messages and social and, and all that. Mine did too. And I don't want to name names, but.
but there was an awful lot of folks that articulated, hey, I don't want to call it a promo. Hey, I don't want to call it an interview. I don't know what to call it. You know, that, and that's super respectful. Yeah. Uh, I, I think super, and, and I get that. Um, but you said something that our listeners, uh, and a lot of times it goes much further than just, our, you know, the, the whole, I'll, I'll say the whole world um, is in on the gag. Yes. I, I think that's how you said it. And I don't want to say kind of point counterpoint, but here's kind of where I'm going with it. It, it is that. I mean, it, it goes without saying every word I said, um, was he as he, emo- I mean, I <sighs> super emotional as real as it gets, but the beauty of our business to me is like none other is that the blurring of the lines, if you will, between that's real, that's story. And when you head down that path, it's like whoever I wrestle or, or, or any of the matches, we, we know it's scripted entertainment. But, but, but the beauty of our industry is when those – and yes, we're in on the gag, and I'm trying to to to, to say this uh, where maybe you you can understand it is it it's just in my heart of hearts the core to, to me it's it's one of the reasons I really really love this industry is that tragic situations and it doesn't erase anything, make anything better, but it's living life on life's terms one day at a time. And here we are. And a whole world gets to see what a great human being Owen in the business that he gave his life to his father gave his life, his life to several brothers, the family. Um, but, but, but here we are in 2024 and, um, the vehicle to, to, to create awareness on who and what Owen was all about is through this professional wrestling tournament. But the, 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 and I hate to even call it art, but that's the only thing that's why I was, I'm, I'm looking for a word is that that is, um, that is a part of, I'll call it kind of the magic of this business that, that I think you have a podcast network wrestling's been around forever monster numbers in and out. They're making all kind of announcements. Uh, the other company about, you know, this venue and this deal, all this, but it all kind of boils down to creating that emotional uh, connection. And, and that's that to me, trying to take a step back and put on my producer cap and watch the talent of the last outlaw, Jeff Jarrett. I think that was what that is, what that's all about real raw emotion channeled into professional wrestling. I say this with all due respect to the other characters in wrestling, but like we all know when the undertaker is on camera talking as the undertaker on a tell on a wrestling program, it's the undertaker it's story, but it's different for you because uh, your character is Jeff Jarrett. And if you were to hold your driver's license up to the camera, don't do that. But if you were, it says Jeff Jarrett on. And so sometimes it's hard to, you know, see where the character stops and the person ends. And I think that's what we as wrestling fans gravitate to. We want to believe, we want to suspend our disbelief. We, we want to be able to say, okay, now I know that's part of the show, but now this, this was real. And that's that emotional connection. That's that authenticity that we're talking about. And that was not a last outlaw promo. That was not a double J promo. That was not a King of the ring or King of the mountain promo. 
That was not the Intercontinental Champion talking. That was not the NWA Champion talking. That was mm. Jeff Jarrett talking about his friend Owen Hart. And Dave Silva's our producer here, and he says in our live chat, our private chat, just you and I and him, Jeff winning the tournament would be the best closing to a movie ever. Lord, what a story. Mm. Because there's better... I, and listen, it feels even disingenuous because what you were sharing was honest. You're, you're happy to celebrate Owen's memory. And I don't know what the original creative plans were. I do feel like maybe they boxed us into a corner when they said it's for a title shot, but we could figure that out later. <laughs> but you got to be there at the end holding up that cup. You got to be there wearing that Owen Hart belt. That Owen Hart belt needs to be behind you. Like, respectfully to everyone else involved in the tournament. This is no longer about who's going to have the flashiest move or who can pin someone's shoulders to the match. It's now the whole, the whole thing now is can Jeff Jarrett pull it off? Mm. That's the story of the entire tournament now. And I think Tony Khan deserves a lot of credit for a putting you in the tournament because mm -hmm. it would have been really easy to say, boy, we can, What's the new flashy, shiny object? What's the next big thing? Whatever. And as you've said, you're maybe on the downhill slope at this stage of your career. Maybe this is a launching pad for some new, young, up-and-coming talent. But that story writes itself. And for mm -hmm. him to not only allow that prom you in the tournament and then that promo to air on TV, but then upload the full thing so folks got the full context there's a lot of other promotions that would not have done that, Jeff. Oh, I'm with you. And I, that's what I'm saying. I've, I've, I'm grateful yeah. across the board. I've, I've, I, and I, you know, I said it um, on the uncut version, Conrad. You know, when I, I think back of those 56 days, we really got in and pulled the layers of the onion back in, in a lot of ways. Uh, my road to recovery was the awareness uh, that I, I I really had to unpack a lot of things. I had to really get to know Jeff better than I thought I did, much better. I, I really had to process some things, um, and. And and once those I always refer to them the, the, those kind of layers of the onion started being peeling back, and I look back on the last seven and a half coming up on eight years, I I just think about my goodness, I am very grateful for so many things, podcast included, pal. But I mean. Karen, the kids, work, your dad, business, all dad. Of that. Just, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, 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 yeah, you know exactly what I mean. I know exactly what you mean, and I'm pulling for you. And I think the entire internet wrestling community is. And what's funny is when you were first announced as being a participant, boy, there was a lot of criticism online, and people, and and people were like. But the, I wanted to see this dream match and that dream match. And nobody's saying that now, Jeff. Oh, sure they are. No, and that's not. part of the rest of the business. Sure they are. I don't think they are. And those folks who are just respectfully, you don't get it. Like, <laughs> you mean, you just don't. Uh, no, well, they signed up. They, they can cheer or boo. Oh, or, sure, sure. But we're allowed to tell them that they're wrong. <laughs> I mean, okay. All right, point taken. <laughs> wrestling is supposed to be like when people are like, hey, what's your favorite memory of wrestling as a kid? Almost never do we hear someone talk about a five-star match. It's, it's about the way something made them feel. I mean, whenever I would ask some of my older friends, hey, what was your favorite angle? Oh, man, the hat and the robe, blackjack and flair. And for me, man, it was like earthquake and Hulk Hogan and the mega powers exploding. And I mean, I keep naming all these Hulk Hogan things, Zeus. Yeah. And we're not five star. What like, Zeus maybe ate at a five star restaurant, but like as a kid, that's what I resonated or what resonated with me. And 
I think you nailed it here. And I think AEW is on to something and I hope they see it all the way through. We got tons of questions about the Owen. I want to answer some of those. Uh, we're doing ask Jeff anything today. And of course, uh, we're going to talk about the Owen St- uh, Steven over on Twitter wants to know, could the Owen Hart cup become a new pay-per-view event for AEW? That's interesting to think, right? What if next year it became its own special pay-per-view? Oh boy. You broadened it out. Uh, Conrad, uh, the Owen Hart is, you know, he tournaments and I've gone into great detail are, are uh, a challenge from a creative perspective because the age of instant gratification, everyone wants to see who's winning, but that, that's it. I want to see who's winning this thing. Uh, and so I think you would have to, to do multiple uh, things around it. I think a standalone, um, I think could be a challenge. One of the things too, that, that I think, um, uh, Conrad, the layers of this set of circumstances, the finals being in Calgary. Yes. Come on. I mean, that is, it's the stampede. And one of the first things that that amazes me about all of this, when I came to work at AEW, um, there were pre-collision and we're going to run house rules. And that obviously was upended by, the collision routing and everything that kind of went with all this. But one of the first uh, set of circumstances was the folks at the stampede reached out. And so I played a part in organizing AEW and the stampede. I'll just kind of leave it at that. But now here we are uh, almost two years later, that just crazy. It, it just, and so the finals and um, just, I don't know where I was going with that, but uh, back to the question. Uh, a standalone event, I think, would be a, a challenge because I think uh, the stories, episodically, the way it's laid out right now, are probably a better route. Scott Gilliland says, with Jeff competing in the Owen Cup, has he considering has he considered wearing some Owen inspired gear? I have not. <laughs> when I when I think about Owen, uh, I think about. The, the singlet and, and, uh, that dude would leave on a 10, 14 day, uh, road trip. And I mean, tell you, he's got one bag and, uh, would wash his clothes on the road and, you know, one jacket. It just, so his tights were the singlet. Um, but, uh, I'm not sure I've worn that singlet, uh, for a short period in my life. So no, I have, uh, not really thought about going down the Owen, uh, attire, uh, route. Mr. Bosch over on Twitter says, Jeff is the only competitor who knew Owen Hart in the Owen Hart tournament. Is Owen a topic brought up by younger talent in the locker room? And what's a favorite Owen story that Jeff likes to share? You know, from time to time, yes, the, 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 the Owen, uh, topic, but you know, and I've, I'm, you know, on the one hand, I'm grateful to to be around, but Owen's active active career ended 25 years ago. So kind of look at our roster and if they're in their mid thirties to late thirties, Owen quit wrestling in their teens. I mean, early. So really before they really had, unless you were, you know, a a, a toddler. So, so with YouTube and, and, and and the library and all that, of course, but uh, as time goes on, you know, there's, Honestly, less and less talk about it, but but that is kind of the beauty of Tony and his initiative and 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 how things have transpired since the launch of of AEW and Brett was a part of wasn't he the first show? I, I think yeah, uh, yeah. or, or early. Um and, and then, you know, the, the Owen Hart foundation and Martha and, and just all the stuff. And I'll just call it kind of water under the bridge, the documentary area and the different things that have kind of led up to the Owen Hart foundation is that that's, that's a, that, that is a, another part of why I get so emotional, but th- because this is an entirely new generation of, of, of fans 
that are exposed to my friend. I, I, and that I don't take that lightly at all. I, I don't want to speak for Martha, but I don't think Martha does uh, either. You know, the Owen Hart Foundation does so much good coast to coast uh, in Canada. I mean, they have, this is how much goes into the Owen Hart Foundation. They have Jerry Seinfeld as their headliner on their biggest fundraiser out of the year. Um, it, it is for people that are, that are listening that may not be, that just look at it through the wrestling lens, and I totally understand that. But the Owen Hart Foundation, the the, the, the people experiencing homelessness and and um, children, and all, I mean all kind of um, nonprofit agencies, and the work that Martha has done over and over and over, and 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 Martha's family, uh, it, it's just it really is amazing. Um, so. The opportunity to expose the career, the life of Owen um, on, on this platform is is just fantastic. We got another question from uh, Jameson Hutchinson, who says, "Can you please ask Jeff about Owen's stay in the Memphis territory and title run, please?" Of course, he's referencing when he wrestled in the USWA at the Mid South Coliseum back in June of 1993. Uh, pretty crazy to think about. He beat Papa Shango to become the USWA champion. Then he would wrestle uh, Jerry Lawler in the Memphis Coliseum. Lawler would eventually beat him in the Memphis Coliseum. And eventually we would even see Brett and Owen tag up against you and Lawler. And then I think we would sort of wind things down a little bit with you wrestling Owen for the USWA heavyweight championship in August of 1993. It was a fun little summer that you guys had in Memphis. What can you share with us about that time? And so going back that far, um, you know, as of late with the WWE TNA relationship um, and and just, you know, forbidden door coming up this weekend, I guess what I'm saying is promotions working with other promotions. Um, it, it, it creates feel-good moments, but um, – in 1993, well, when we've documented this, it, it, you know, the territory system was essentially over. Conrad, j- just real quick, when, when, God, merger was 86 with NWA, Watts was gone, Florida was gone, Kansas City was gone, Texas was eventually gone, 92, all this. But the territories were l- really gone late 80s. Uh, That's right. By 93, uh, it's, it's like, Joel Goodhart oh. running some stuff here and there. Talk about the original OGs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The reason, the All reason I'm saying that is that Lawler, super talented, the king of Memphis, he, he wasn't, and look, he's still in the business. He he obviously, and him and my father being partners, all right, what are the next steps? Well, my dad had uh, the deep relationship with Vince, and um, out of that sprung, okay, hey, Jerry, J- Jerry was up. You know, and that's when I reason I'm saying all this is the Jerry Lawler, Bret Hart feud was kind of around this time, but Memphis was not dead yet. And so how, and this is where, you know, in the spirit of good business, Hey, I could just hear my dad. Hey, Vince, you think we can work at a little deal here? And what's that little deal, Jerry mean? Well, uh, can we can get Brett knowing, uh, and just when I, at the time, I'd, it didn't really soak in, but you know, Brett and Owen are on the road full time with WWF. So on their off days, they're coming to a small territory, wrestling on their off days. Uh, I'll never forget Owen. And these are some of the first times I, I met him. Him like referencing the Memphis ring that was not a <laughs> up to par uh, WWF ring. Uh, but Hey, those guys came down, their father was in the business. And I, I said this on the, the uncut interview and I've said it so many times being the son of a promoter and Owen being the son of a promoter, the, the, the instant bond of, we didn't have to tell each other. We didn't have to have like two kids. There was no warm up period. I know what he's been through. He knew what I'd been through. We had a, a very, very common a uh, set of circumstances, uh, uh, upbringing, if you will. And so that was the, the the foundation of our relationship. And so, you know, th- those guys coming down and, and that tag match, 
that was a, a lot of fun. I've seen clips of that, but you know, Brett and Owen and I- anyway, that was the start of our relationship that I remember, remember, <coughs> remember fondly. But, um, yeah, w- on paper, when you think about, um, Papa Shango versus Owen Hart, uh, at the mid South Coliseum, it just kind of a, a head scratcher, but that was the summer of 90. Super fun. Uh, KC wants to know, speaking of Owen, did Owen ever play any in-ring ribs on Jeff, uh, involving a match? I mean, now, I'm glad that now we're getting to some fun stuff here, Connie. You know, I mean, I, we could talk at length in my WWE hall of fame speech. And, and we, uh, came up with it that day, uh, where, uh, Edge and Christian came out and put the red nose uh, on me it was a complete tribute to Owen because uh, KC, um, the, the answer to your question is every match I had with Owen, there was some type of small rib or big rib. But th- the last in ring rib that Owen played um, was just such a classic. And I've told the story multiple times, but you know, the business was hot. I'll give my Ricky Morton sold out hanging from the rafters, but legitimately you can probably go back and look of, uh, what the, what the house show did a Saturday, um, May 22nd, 1999 all state arena, a house show. Uh, but, uh, we're on a tag run and we'd work with edge and Christian multiple times. Um, and so we, or less had our match down. Owen was late to the building. He would fly in day one uh, from from the uh, start of the tour, and he was late to the building. Uh, me, Edge, and Christian were obviously already there, and Owen comes in, and we knew he could get dressed in a hurry, but he's like, hey, Jeff, come here. Come here, come here. And and he pulls me in the bathroom, and he's tying his boots as he's telling me this, and he's got these two red noses. And he's like, all right, here's what we're doing. And I'm like, he said, you know the spot where they end up throwing us together? But before they do, we're both, we take a tackle and we end up in the corners and they go up on the turnbuckles and give us the 10 count punch and blah, 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 blah. And he says, in the middle of that, uh, turn to the side and uh, on 10, uh, put on your red nose and then they'll shoot us together. And he said, make sure the noses go off up in the air. And just, uh, uh, just Owen, he, I heard Taker uh, not long ago on something on his podcast that, you know, Owen would rib him. And when you kind of rib him, that's, that, that's Owen, you know, he's working with undertaker He'd shoot him off and call the most outlandish duck the elbow twice. I'm going to hit you with a flying spin kick, get a one, two and kick out, grab the headlock. And he's dead serious. And he can call it like that. And, and it, anyway, I could go on and on and talk about, but yes, Owen has ribbed me. There's nobody that he hasn't ribbed. If you got in the ring. Mark wants to know what would it mean to Jeff Jarrett if he won the whole tournament? I'll let Mark, I'll, I'll, I'll let you and Conrad, uh, and Dave Meltzer, uh, Sean Ross Sapp, uh, Mike Johnson, anybody else out there who I, I I'll let them answer for me. Uh, because I, there's no way I can. Spock's evil clone has a fun question. Something I never even thought about. I think you'll dig it. Had Owen's accident not happened and Jeff still goes on to co-found TNA. Does he think that Owen would have worked for TNA in some capacity at some point, either as a talent or possibly an agent? Owen and TNA. How great would that have been? A dream come true because when you, you know, turn that page, we've talked to, and I've often tried to focus on, the, the human being though Owen was, and then others like to talk about his in ring, but, but Owens, it came so easy to him on the one hand, because he grew up around it. Brothers that wrestled, uh, he had been to Japan, Mexico, uh, you know, worked in all this, but Owen as a producer wouldn't have been just good. He would have been great. And it goes without saying that, Owen's accident in passing would be, if not the peak uh, of the Attitude Era, but it was right in that kind of time frame in that 
know, had Owen not passed, he would have got to see the PG era. And he would have got to see, as it relates to TNA, a, a young upstart company that, hey, man, this X Division, it's, it's mainly compiled of guys that are kind of fresh off the independent scene. Got a lot of lucha, got a little bit of lucha in it, got a little bit of Japan, Japanese style, which would Owen would hit to eat that up. And 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 there's some high flying on this, but man, like Jerry Lynn, and I was with Jerry this past weekend in, in Cleveland. Um, you know, when, when I look at Jerry and and everybody looks at Jerry Jerry and has different thoughts and opinions, and what a great guy and what a great worker. I, I mean, the first thing, um, uh, the, the, literally the, the first thing that I think of when I, when I see Jerry is, man, that's a great dude. Boy, he was the glue of the extra. People just don't understand that, that he was such a integral part of the early X division days as being the glue, whether he was in the match or not backstage producing it. That's why I say, Owen, that, that is a fun thought to think about, uh, him being a, a producer, a talent, um, just being a part of it would have been so, so cool. We got another one here from, uh, B- Ben Zonify. I screwed that up. I always thought a feud between yourself and James storm and TNA. Who's the real cowboy would have been the tits. Was this never in the works? Do you remember that ever being discussed a feud with you and James storm would have been the tits. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we talked about, and we had one-off matches here and there, but, uh, Benza, Benzin, Afa, however you want to say that. Uh, candidly, pal, I was the king of the mountain in the early days of TNA and really for the run, and James was a cowboy. So we weren't competing cowboys uh, under really any any set of circumstances. So that wouldn't have, have been a feud, cowboy versus cowboy. That 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 was not really accurate. Uh, we 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 had multiple matches and um, I can't say enough about James in ring work and how he connected with the TNA faithful. What was special for sure. We got another one here from 82 Atlantic. What was the relationship like between sting and Vince Russo and TNA? Was there any heat that lingered from WCW or do they always have a good rapport? You know, let, let me ask you, let me throw something back at you, Conrad, and, and then I'll answer. Did any of this get discussed on who killed WCW, the Sting Russo nope. relationship? Oh, yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't. I mean, those two guys always got along professionally extremely well. Personally, I think even better. Um, now, Sting didn't always like or go for or whatever it is, but Sting had, had so much diplomacy, if you will, that, um, he would say no to multiple situations, but he would tell you why and come up with options and everything that goes with it. But they had a really, really good relationship. I think all through the WCW run, uh, in that, that, that I think they understood each other to a certain degree and knew that Sting was mature enough to go, all right, uh, this guy, because, you know, fresh out of WWE and this New Yorker, and he wants to do this and that, and this and that he's ambitious, man, it just might not, uh, work out the way he's hoping for, but Hey, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. So they always had, in my opinion, or my observation, great relationship. Brian Kaufman on Twitter wants to know, was Jeff asked to be a part of who killed WCW? Uh, unofficially, I, I might have been, I don't know, one of the early ones, but I was aware of it and it was almost as if I'll say this, I, I, I assumed, and I think they assumed, yeah, I was going to be a part of it. Um, it didn't work out and I, I would assume that me signing with AEW, um, but you tell me, Conrad, were there AEW talent on there? I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, so, so wait, hang on. You you thought you were going to be on it. They thought you were going to be on it, but then you weren't. But I was never officially asked. I was told 
hey, the next series, I don't know if it was Tales of the Territory. Yeah, Tales or, from the or, Territories, yeah. Was, or was there a season before that of Bash of the Beach? Which came from, I don't know. But but I love those guys. We've talked about it. They 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 do, I, I'll say, it's a lightning rod. Some folks in the industry absolutely hate it. Uh, some folks like it. Um, I, I think they're trying to create uh, content that rates, uh, and you can't fault them for that. They're like anyone else in the world. They're trying to make a buck. Uh, and sometimes that doesn't set right with, with folks. And I get that too. Uh, I really do. But no, I, I did the bash at the beach, the tales of the territory, that episode of me and Lawler, Jimmy Hart, Dutch, that will always be Conrad. I just can't tell you how that day of taping uh, went, but um, I, yeah, th there were conversations about it, but it never came to fruition. I'll just say that. We brought up Russo. You brought up Bash at the Beach. I can't believe this is real, but we actually had Vince Russo join us live last week on adfreeshows.com following episode three of Who Killed WCW. Whoop, he's, whoop, and Russo. Like, what the hell is going on, Connie? It was a crazy week at adfreeshows.com, but we got to ask Vince uh, if he could set the record straight of what exactly did or did not happen at Bash at the Beach, at least from his perspective. Let's take a listen. Bro! Everybody was in on it, okay? Eric was in on it. Hulk was in on it. Here's the only thing they didn't know because I didn't know, okay? I told, you know, Eric Eric and Hulk, they had to leave the building because if they didn't leave the building, when I went out there to cut my book a promo, Hulk would have had to come out and kill me. So they had to leave the building, okay? And my exact words to Hulk was, I am go, I will cut a scathing promo on you. Dan, I did not give Hulk the word for word promo because I didn't know what I was going to say. I never did scripted promos, bro. Every time I, I, I did a promo, bro, I got in the moment. I knew where my character was. There was nothing on paper. Every promo I cut was emotion and came from my heart. So did Hogan know the promo word for word? No, he didn't because I didn't know. As far as the laying down and them leaving and all that stuff, bro, the only one that wasn't in this, and Conrad, you can ask him, I did not tell Jeff. I did not tell Jeff that night. I told Jeff the following day. Jeff, Jeff that night, thought everything was a shoot. I did not smarten Jeff up because I wanted Jeff's real emotion. I told Jeff the next day, Jeff, we were all in on this, you know, blah, 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 blah. But like I said, Conrad, you, you want to send anybody to my house at any time. Conrad, you can, you can give them a list of questions. I'll answer anything, bro. I got no problem with that. I, I would love, like I said, I need one person to tell me why at 63 years old uh, am I lying about something that happened 25 freaking years ago. Vince Russo offered me the opportunity to hook him up to a lie detector test. I'm happy to say we are going to work on that. See the full Vince Russo conversation, as well as the Violent J conversation, and a whole host of bonus content. How much? How about more than 100,000 hours of bonus content? We are the exclusive home for folks like Lex Luger and Kevin Sullivan and David Crockett and Blue Meanie and Mike Chioda and Nick Patrick, plus all of my fabulous podcast hosts. Everybody is doing live interactive Q&As. You get all of the old StarCast stage shows and so much more at adfreeshows.com. You even get to be a part of our live studio audience. And we've actually got a pretty good question here from Bobby, great friend of the show who's with us live. And he says, if Owen had gone to WCW when Brett did. No, wait, 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 wait. You're not going to let me get no, the, the Russo? I would love for you to. Oh, I, I, how many bros did you get in that? One? Oh, I didn't count. Should have. We needed a bro counter. We should have done that. I'll we do that next it. time. It's interesting. God bless him. That, it was good to see him, but he's saying at 63 years old, why would anybody? Man, he was, what did you say to get him so wound up? That was compelling content, right? 
I think I said, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program, Vince Russo. And then I just set my headphones down and hit the mute button, and I just was, watched. Was he, wound up? was he wound up? Well, listen, you know, everybody's been coming for him pretty hot and heavy because of this whole who killed WCW thing. And I don't oh, know how much of that is really fair. Like, I pointed out in our recording last week when people were like, oh, we put the belt on a non-wrestler. Everybody always gravitates to the David Arquette circumstance and situation. But if you really appreciate what happened, he pinned Eric Bischoff. He pinned a non-wrestler. It yes. was the, the, it wasn't a re it's not like he get, came out there and beat Goldberg with his finish. Like that's not what happened. And on the other channel, Vince was champion. Vince won the damn thing a year prior and nobody says anything. And, and he was the boss. He owned it. He made himself. That was September of 1999 when he did that. So that's a Vince Russo booking that happened at the tail end of his w, WWF run. At a time when the other champions were The Undertaker, Stone Cold, The Rock, and Triple H. And now it's Vince McMahon, and nobody says boo. But a year later, when they're asked to co-promote a movie, and they tried to get some mainstream publicity, and he donated all the money to wrestler families, it's like, can we just give David Arquette a break for once? I mean, my goodness. Are we going to, on this episode, are we, are we going to talk about who kills CW, WCW on another episode that I don't want to get into it right now? If you want to wait and, and we'll talk later. We'll talk about it as much as you'd like. I actually do want to ask you a WCW question here. Bobby wants to know if Owen had gone to WCW when Brett did, would Jeff have gone to WCW then as well? Now I appreciate the way Bobby asked it, but let me ask differently. If instead of Owen re upping and when Owen leaves and he has an opportunity to get a new contract with WWF and I get why he did that. But his brothers-in-law, Davey Boy and Jim Neidhart, they both went to WCW. If Owen had went to WCW, do you think there was a chance that you would have gone back to WCW or had that, as long as Bischoff was there, it was a non-starter. But I mean, contractually bound, it, it, it's, you know, I, I signed from 93 to 96, WCW, 96 to 97. Getting down to then, I read the tea leaves. The flare thing wasn't going anywhere. I kind of knew where my value was. I knew that, hey, Vince was more than open to come on back, going to pay very, very well and give me an opportunity. Went up there for the two years, as everybody, as we've talked on this podcast, knew that, okay, I get it. JR, I'm not um, maybe in his uh, top echelon of, of picks. And politically speaking, I'm not throwing shade on Jim. That's the nature of the beast. I get it. Vince is taking his company public. Oh boy. It looks like there's an opportunity. My dad's old buddy, JJ Dillon. Let me kind of find out if there's any interest. Well, Vince was all taking his company public. JR was, I'll say maybe playing, being a very, very tough negotiator. WCW said, Nope, we're going to pay you this. And Oh, by the way, if you will really get off your ass and work, we're going to pay you a healthy sum to do every house show, which I was more than willing to do 33, 34 years old. So my contract dictated when I could and couldn't go. So I'm not exactly sure I can answer that question even in the hypothetical, but I will, if you want me to Conrad, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Let's uh, talk about another question that Bobby had here. When did you sign your first guaranteed contract and with what promotion? What did that process look like? I mean, we've all heard about the opportunity contract that the WWF used to push out. So I assume that was your first WWF contract. Was your guaranteed. first guaranteed one, the WCW one, when you went in 96? 93. We're going to guarantee you per year 10 shows, and we're going to guarantee you 150 bucks for each of those. Promise you. Jeff, 10 shows on a 50 buck show. But in 96, WCW is my first guaranteed, whether you work a day or not. Well, I tell you, there's another guarantee, and it's that smooth sack summer is officially upon us. Jeff <laughs> is hairless between his legs right now. He's ready. He's ready for action. And when you're playing in the summer sun, make sure you've been groomed from pubes to bum. Thanks to our friends at Manscaped. You can make this season your smoothest yet. The Performance Package 5.0 Ultra is the ultimate bundle to keep your boys downstairs cool while looking hot, join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our exclusive offer. Get 20% off plus free shipping when you go to manscaped.com and use the promo code MYWORLD. Summertime and the trimming's easy. This Manscaped Performance Package 5.0 has all, everything you need to prepare that summer bod. And every guy knows how scary it can be when you go for a close shave. Uh, <clears throat> 
downstairs. And that's why we trust Manscaped for all the sensitive areas. Let's talk about the star of the show. It's the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. It's a fifth generation trimmer that just keeps getting better. And now it's got two interchangeable next gen skin safe blade heads, a standard one to take a little off the top and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. They've also got dual LED spotlights to provide contrast on multiple skin tones, three length setting combs. And did I mention this trimmer is waterproof too? You can use it in the beach, the lake, or the shower. It'll even devour the strongest pubes. Now that you've got the perfect haircut, let's make sure that we got the liquid formulations to keep that freshness all summer long. We're talking about the crop soother. It's an aftershave lotion and a crop preserver, anti-chafing ball deodorant. Once they touch your sack, you'll never go back. They've even got two free gifts in the performance package 5.0, the Manscaped boxers and the shed travel bag. If you're looking for even more wet products, say no more. The new buff bundle is all you need to keep hot in the summer breeze. They've also got the silicone scrubber and the body wash. Get rid of your nasty ass loofah. Let's get some freshness and let's get 20% off plus free shipping with the code MYWORLD at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code MYWORLD at manscaped.com. It's smooth sack summer boys. Get on board or get left behind. Once you, uh, what was your sack? You won't go back. What was that little? Yeah. Well, once these touch your sack, you won't go back. <laughs> and no waffle stops today. No waffle not, not- stops today. I don't want to make it a regular piece of the programming just yet, but. Bless your heart. I, Dave, he, hey, Dave, just, are you okay? There's been lots of discussion, uh, about grooming and wrestling. Okay. Um, once upon a time, I, I actually heard. Tracy Smothers asked a kid on an indie show, Hey kid, shave my back. And it was explained as, as this guy is lathering up Tracy Smothers back. It's just part of paying your dues in the business. And then we heard years later, a pretty funny story. I'm sure it's not really true about buff Bagwell and how he had some help grooming sometime. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm curious is part of your routine when you're making appearances. Does miss Karen have to help you reach some of those hard to reach spots? Uh, no, you know what? She would. Well, she does get, uh, the trimmer out kind of, and from time to time, she gets back, but no, I I don't think I can get the queen. You know what? I'm going to let you ask her that Conrad. If you just say maybe in a group chat, maybe not Cody. (laughs) <laughs> but just say karen i've got a question to ask you and this is for business which is immediately going to get her in the mind frame that yes. okay serious business say karen we talk about a lot of intricate details and you know as well as i do that really getting the story behind the story is is what it's all about on my and then you just proceed to ask her a sack question. You think you can do that? I, I'll be glad to text Karen about your sack as soon as we finish recording. <laughs> We're going to get all sacked out here. And you need to, too. Use that promo code MYWORLD. Get 20% off and free shipping. Uh, it's fun to do yourself. It's even more fun when the queen of the mountain does it for you. Um, you, have a clean sack, you never go back. You know what? I just thought of an idea. An interactive StarCast event. Oh, boy. Hey, and you know what? Buff could be the judge. Oh, wow. If you can get the top guys to just say, hey, Manscaped, who, maybe there's a speed contest, speed contest. Maybe there's like a creative contest. And then. Oh, uh, I got it. Dutch Mantel. He just brings the the rug. There you go. Miguel Perez to bring the rug. And then we get some artists down there and they're going to do a wrestling inspired shaving, like an ice carving, but the wrestling version. Money brother with back hair. Money. Yeah. And and maybe there's an unknown uh, top guy that, that may have his own rug. What if we have Lash LaRue do the cutting? He's so artistic anyway. Buddy here. Just off the cuff today. This is just Dave green. A lot of chatter today that can make you, uh, uh, front and center in front of Manscaped, pal. I'm fired up about this, man. I, I mean, am too. I mean, remember Edward Scissorhands, the way he'd get out there with those bushes and do some art? We could do that with Manscaped. Yes, we sure could. Listen, start practicing now, boys and girls. Use our promo code MYWORLD. You'll get 20% off, but you don't want to get left out. You want to be a no. part of this. Don't you want to shave Dutch Mantel's back? Lord knows I do. 
Uh, <laughs> what are we doing? What uh, are we doing? <laughs> Men's 316 wants to know if Jeff could relive any run or moment in his career, what would it be? Um, I mean, that's so open ended, but we've talked about on this and you know, the Ric Flair last match, I, I guess we can say it's controversial in a couple of different ways, but, but the, I'll just say the success of that hats off to my partner, Conrad Thompson the team he put together. But, you know, that 96 story, and and I've enjoyed having our man, the Taskmaster, but Kevin's kind of vision of it, and at the time, um, I'm coming into WCW, you know, if I could relive that and, and, and all parties get on board, no injuries, if you will, maybe no or less politics, I, I really think me and Rick could have had a, uh, a magic moment on pay-per-view. I really do. On my 30th birthday, we had that singles match in Orlando on Nitro. Um, I, I, I would have, I'd, I'd like to have maybe seen how that would have uh, played out. Obviously, SD twenty five sixty nine says, "What were the negotiations like between TNA and WWE in twenty twelve for Christian Cage to appear at Slammiversary? TNA attempt to get anyone else in exchange for Flair appearing at the WWE Hall of Fame for the Four Horsemen induction, and how was Christian backstage?" People, uh, so, some folks on here are, are, are well aware, but in 2012, I was so far removed from the creative process. My focus was on live events and, and, and international growth, the growth of live events and the growth of international. So I have almost zero context for this. Christian backstage, he's always been great. Um, but as far as the negotiations, the in, in, you know who were part of it, I have, uh, I wasn't, so I have no real knowledge. <clears throat> this one comes to us from, uh, Dakota Kellogg. Have you seen any of Joe Hendry's work and would you rather do a duet with him or have a one-on-one -on -one match against him? Oh, a duet. That's a no brainer. Yes. Joe Hendry. And th that's going back to, you know, multiple reasons why I love the industry and, 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 and the viral sense of, uh, I guess it's the, the, and you can call it a tweet, the, the post. What do you call it? You don't call it a tweet anymore. Is it a, I call it a, a tweet because I don't give a damn. Yeah, but is it, is it called, proper term, an X post, a post on X, maybe? Anyway, um, that, that's, that's like the fan base is, it, it just, I guess that highlights just kind of, um, the fun of it all. So, but a duet for sure. Uh, wrestling's wrestling. I'd love to do a duet with Joe. Maybe, maybe we can uh, speak that into existence. Conrad. Hey, I'm for it. Um, here's a fun question that you sort of teased earlier. Big daddy. Woo wants to know since the who killed WCW series came out, what is your take on it? Now, as folks are listening to this, I want to remind you the finale is tonight live on vice. It's going to air at 9 uh, p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern, and immediately following it, Eric Bischoff and I will be live at 83weeks.com, and we're going to have some special guests stop by and chime in on what they thought of the series. But you and I haven't spent much time talking about the series. Have you had a chance to catch the first three episodes? What do you think? I, I'm going to watch them all at once. Funny you say this. Last week, flying uh, United Flight Nashville to, uh, uh, to Dulles. And, um, I caught maybe 20 minutes and that would have been of week two because week three hadn't aired yet. Uh, but it was coming up and my, my flight was over, but, um, it talked about Eric walking in the house and, or walking, you know, going in when they let him go. Um, it was compelling that, that, that whole story of, you know, in a lot of ways he had orchestrated and built it. Okay. Now I'm, I'm, I'm gone September of 99. Uh, so anyway, I've, I've, that's the only context I have, but to take, to take, to go all the way back. And I know episode four, uh, what's my take on it? Conrad, what specific, I mean, just the overall take, I guess they're asking, right? How much has Vince McMahon named? 
been involved in this first three episodes? A little bit, but you assume it's going to be a lot in the finale. Okay. Because at the end of the day, who killed WCW? Look, you can talk about, and uh, God rest his soul, uh, thoughts and prayers. Who's with the Jamie Kellner family. Uh, he just passed away uh, over the weekend. You know, uh, you know, I think you can point fingers and, I think Vince Russo said something to the effect, how can you claim a writer and all this? But to me, at the end of the day, uh, there's one man that that killed WCW, and that's Vince McMahon by design. And it took him a while, and it took um, a nitro and rattling the cage and 83 weeks of maybe getting his ass whipped. Uh, but... Uh, the, the the single vision uh, of and and like I've said many times, the difference uh, of the two organizations that I found out maybe night one in WCW is that when you have uh, one guy where the buck stops versus a a, a corporate set of circumstances, it, it is a no brainer. But uh, Vince killed his competition by design down to. When, when when you kind of think of okay we're going to take them off the air and and okay then there's going to be some stickiness and red tape and where's Fusion Media and Bischoff and what are we going to do this Vince letting them know yeah and I'm actually going to give you a couple of million bucks for your library it, it it was like the final nail but to me Vince killed it by design and it was I can't say a single focus. But it was right up there at one of the top priorities that I believe drove him day in and day out once Nitro, maybe not when it was launched, but real quick when the ratings came out and Nitro beat Raw, my gut tells me Vince said, I'll kill this thing and anything in my power. That's the DNA of Vince. So I think Vince killed WCW. And when you say Vince, you mean McMahon, just so everybody understands. Correct. Correct. Uh, Eva Full wants to know, when are Jeff and his guitar going to be added to AEW Fight Forever? That's a good question. That's, yeah, it is a good question, but that is way out of my bailiwick, as we say. I have no idea. Uh, interesting. Um, I have no idea. Good question. Uh, Brendan wants to say, Shawn Michaels has stated that his feud with you could have been longer. Is there a feud that you had that you wish could have been longer? Is it besides flair? Is there another one besides flair? Shawn's j- j- the set of circumstances in that man go back from a, I don't want to say a historical point of view, but yeah, when you kind of analyze that, I'll say. When, when did Brett become champion? Would that be, when, when did they start the new generation? Brett won it in 93. That's what I thought. Well, so, well late 92, but I mean, he was the champ for all the 90. Okay. So just that new generation, I came in at the end of 93, 94, just kind of, I'll say, and it was a, a, a radical change. The business in 92, steroid era, man, it was down, down. Live events, WCW, I think, canceled all their house shows. Both companies were down, 91 and 92. So as I call it the new generation era in the building blocks of it all and putting it together, and then there was, you know, I'll call it on the hillside, uh, me, Sean, uh, and it, well, there's a few others, but when when Sean flipped babyface and – I think there could have been a tremendous amount of, of, of a run of all kinds of matches and stipulations and stories, integrate road dog, uh, obviously Scott and Kevin. I, I think there could have been a, a lot of moving parts that ended up as the thread of, of a Jeff Sean, uh, it wasn't in the cards, wasn't in the stars, but I, I think that I think Sean's right. I think in an extended story between us, we only had one pay-per-view match. Uh, but man, I, I think it could have been. Uh, uh, I, 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 you know, I think it could have really been, in my eyes, 
that program that I needed. Uh, and I've, you know, I, I think I've said that multiple times, but, um, wasn't meant to be. And, um, but yeah, I think that is a, an extended, uh, program that I think could have paid dividends for all involved. Hilarious question here from FFT steel. And he wants to know, why are you still wrestling? You done it all. I'm not criticizing you at all. I still enjoy you in the ring. I just want to understand why you're still in the ring. How about that, Conrad? You want to answer that before I answer it? FF no. Steel, why why'd you go to work today? Like no, you've no, been no, working no. a long time. No, I'm just saying, like, I know the backstory of 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 your specific thing. But when people come to this question of, hey, why are you doing your job? Why are you pursuing your passion? Why are you doing this thing you've loved your whole life and everybody it's says you're hard good? on FF Steel? No, but I mean, you know the story. I I mean. I'm, I'm living, uh, a life that I, I'm living it one day at a time, but I had no idea it. it and I went to top guy weekend and there's some pictures of, uh, my shirt and my sport coat that looked hanging off you. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I had, uh, man, that, how, that how much a, weight did you lose? 30 pounds? 30 I didn't pounds? weigh and I'm glad I didn't, but I'd say, a, easy 25 yeah right wouldn't you say more than that okay yeah um but kind of coming out of that i i told myself you know what i'm gonna get uh in the best shape of my life i thought i was in kind of good shape you know my alcohol was years behind me and all that but um i just said hey, i'm gonna do what i can do to get in the very best shape of my life and the next thing you know Conrad's plans that he had laid out for Ric Flair's last match. I, I guess you could say option one. Or I'll let you, you know, option one or two or three, four, five. I don't know what what didn't kind of work out. And it just one thing led to another, led to another. I remember sitting in the creative room in the summer of 2022 and something came up. And after the meeting was over, I went and asked the head writer did I just hear this right? He just looked at me. Yeah. And it's like three, two in the, I don't know if I've told you the story, uh, Conrad, but I, I don't know how late it was, but it was late. Uh, and I said, did I just hear that right at the end of the meeting? He looked at me and said, yep. He said, just get on the elevator and go get you Uber and go, go to your hotel. Cause I'm blind. But, but, but the, the, the idea of me being special ref at, at, uh, SummerSlam and, you know, j just one thing led to another, um, that happened, and then the match happened at Rick Fair last match, and then AEW, and buddy, I'm having the time of my life. Uh, so why do I do it? Be obviously because I love it. Obviously, it's covering my job, but but I believe that uh, my mindset is um, I'm responsible for the effort. Guys are responsible for the outcome. We could close the show right there. That's great. Uh, one of the users over on YouTube wants to know who's the best monster gimmick you've been in the ring with. Ooh. Well, Conrad, I know it's, <laughs> I would love let me to get, absolutely give our good friend. Let me get the clipboard. Hang on. I know. I know. Get that out. I mean, we're rolling around the football season. I mean, the fact that the guy still. I mean, it's embarrassing. It I mean, is. you hear about him being this uber talented producer and great team member and a lot of camaraderie. And he brings not just his A game, but his A plus game to work every day. But at the end of the day, and you know, his in ring talent was phenomenal, just absolutely one of the best monster gimmicks. But the fact that he thinks Joe Burrow is better than uh, Joe Montana. I mean, it puts him, would you say at the bottom of the barrel? I mean, I think he's probably under uh, Shockmaster, but I, I, that's that's a little harsh. Best monster gimmick, I'll say this. Uh, Memorial Day 94, 95. I bet 95 in the ring and the gong goes off and me and Road Dog were wrestling Taker. It, it, there's that, that gimmick, and I've said it a, a, a few times. 
no disrespect to Rock and Austin and even Hogan and, and, and Cena and others. But I mean, when, when you really think about the run that the Undertaker had, it's, it's unparalleled. I mean, main event status from 87 or 8 through, what would that be, 2019, 2020, whenever the uh, match with AJ Styles on Mania. A, a 30-something year run at the very top and all the, you know, he was in the air, obviously, monthly pay-per-views, and he was made event right up there. I mean, I just don't think, as far as a monster gimmick and no disrespect to Andre or anybody of the big men out there, I just don't think Mark has a peer. Lawrence Brink wants to know, greetings all the way from South Africa. If you had a choice of which move to take, would you much rather get hit in the head with a guitar or take the mandible claw from Mr. Sacco? Uh, Lawrence Brink, hope all is well. Over there in South Africa, I really, really do. But you got to be out of your freaking mind. I'll take that mandible call seven days a week and twice on Sunday. Dave McClay, friend of the show, says, if WWE did a most wanted treasures about you, what are some cool things out there in the career of Double J that come to mind? Is there anything you'd like to hunt down? Oh, hunt down. I was going to say, Conrad, let me ask you, with this chair, does oh gosh, be- yes. <laughs> they need that. And the- Ben Brown needs that in the WWE warehouse. I farted well, I in this cushion when I came up with the name of this. <laughs> and then I farted in this cushion when I thought of the monster's ball. Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, most treasure out there. Well, Ben, the WWE ha- has a lot of them. Um, is there something to. I don't know, like a, uh, well, the guitar that I hit Moolah with at the time was shocking. That guitar would be pretty cool. But is there a Beetlejuice piece of memorabilia that might play into this? That Uh, Superman outfit would be awesome. I was going to say the the Superman outfit, obviously, obviously mine, that, that would, that would play well. I'll say that. Well, something else that plays well. And if we're really looking for a most wanted treasure, well, I think Ben Brown and WWE and A&E, they might actually have to cross parties and go across the aisle and go visit your pal RJ City. Because oh. as we've been recording this morning, he just found something of yours from your career that I think Ben Brown would love to get his hands on, and I can't wait for you to see it. Silva, just hit delete, whatever in the hell he's got cooked up. Please, please just hit delete. I can tell, I could tell by the way you leaned into the microphone. I was in, they were, oh boy. I, now you're grinning. <laughs> Folks, I'm going to give you play by play. When Conrad cocks his shoulders at about a, I don't know, 45 <laughs> degree angle and leans into the microphone and won't look you in the eye, but, but starts to uh, roll out with a smirk on his face. RJ City says he just found this under his bed. Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't already, go check out our YouTube because we are live right now at myworldpod.com showing Jeff what has to be what helped buy that Corvette that he shirtless (laughs) and posed in front of. This was the epitome of picture money, is it not? This is without question. You could probably engrave that at the very bottom picture money. I, I guess it was told to me. I was a, a, an OG of uh, only fan just uh, differently. <laughs> look, Conrad, look, I, I, I bet I weighed 160 pounds. That's uh, year one. So you, you, you weigh more than that. 170. Maybe. You, you, got, your, you, you got some musk, muscle on you. How do you think you are right there? I can tell you. Cause I sold that. Um, uh, yeah, no, that's, that is, uh, 19, I'm 18 or 19. Is that your Corvette or your dad's or whose is that? Uh, that would, that would be mine. That was, uh, 
You had a Corvette at 18 years old. Oh boy. Here we go. I see why uh, Stone Cold hated your ass. <laughs> Golly. But you stop. Well, it's like Stone Cold was once told. You can stare at it all you want. It ain't going to get any bigger. Unless you go to bluechew.com. It's a unique <laughs> online service that delivers you the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. Now, listen, not everybody has a poster of Jeff Jarrett under their bed. Some of us need to take matters into our own hands. We need a little hot tag for our wiener, and that's where Blue Chew comes in. You can take them anytime, day or night, so plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises, and the process is simple. You'll sign up at BlueChew.com. You'll consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversation, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. But there won't be anything discreet about your package. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex, so discover your options at BlueChew.com. Let's chew it and do it. Here's a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code MYWORLD at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com. The promo code is MYWORLD, and you receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring today's podcast. My goodness. I just love it. Back for you. I love that old stuff. Oh, God, Brad. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's uh, do a question here from the nice loser over on uh, Twitter. He says there were petitions before he appeared in the movie, The Wrestler, and before he appeared on Ring of Honors, maybe 2007 era, for TNA to sign the Necro Butcher. Did you hear any of the buzz around him? And did you or TNA look at any of his work, particularly his matches with Samoa Joe or low key? We haven't talked about Necro butcher before we had, you know, and, and Necro kind of fell into that. Um, God, who was I just talking recently? Because like ROH and TNA started within three or four or five months of each other. It's February and June. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, ironically. So we started at the same time. And then as, we were growing. It, it it never got in a like any kind of war. We certainly realized that the most we could give guys was one or two days work, but we had to look at Spike in the eye and let them know All right, these guys are our priority. It, and, and to our knowledge, and there was a lot of guys, the Briscoes, uh, God, because D- Dutch was out of the entire creative team. I'd probably say Dutch was the most in tune with the ROH product. Dutch was a fan of his. Um, he, he's a character. At the end of the day, he's a character, but he was under contract. Um, that's why I'm trying to, I think I've told the story when I was having lunch, uh, a breakfast with Mick way back over something. That, but anyway, he's one who, who said, hey, Joe's deals up or coming up or there's an interest in him or whatever it was. But ROH was having their guys under some type deals, and we were too. But for the most part, we were guys were working both companies, but there came to a kind of a, a, a fork in the road, if you will, where we had to have our guys exclusive. And, and so I don't think we ever gave Necro any serious consideration. We got to do a question here from Har Movie Barbecue. Good morning, fellas. Did Jeff get to meet Michael J. Fox on the set of Life with Mikey? And does he have any memories of him? A pros pro. We absolutely did. Me and Lawler uh, flew to Toronto, stayed in four seasons. Uh, at that stage of my career, I'd never stayed in four seasons. It was very nice. Uh, but yes, he was on set. Um, let's say he was executive producer of the movie. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But he, you know, he he absolutely uh, was there because we shot that scene. He had his stunt double, but he was up in the audience and they did their lines. And so, yeah, Michael was around um, the whole time. And then if you know the movie well enough, Lawler got the guy up in a press slam and spun him around and then threw him on me, uh, I believe. Uh, But the next cut of it was Michael down in the ring and Michael was actually in the ring, uh, the Michael J. Fox. So he was a sweetheart of a guy, a pros pro and, and very, he was not standoffish whatsoever. And I remember me and Lawler talking about, okay, here's, here's this big star, but 
uh, we, we were all on set together and, and made it a, a fun day's work. Uh, me and Lawler's one who had to bump on a boxing ring, but other than that, it's a lot of fun to do that scene. Jeff, we have been uh, inundated this month here in June of 2024. I realize that people find our podcast and, and go back and do deep dives later and catch up. So just want to add context. This is June of 2024. And the most viral thing that has happened all year happened this month. And before we clicked record, when you first joined the live recording, you did your own iron sheik and hit us with the old hot <laughs> uh, That young lady happens to be from your neck of the woods. She's from Tennessee. No yeah, she's she has a nine three one phone number. She's from Tennessee, so okay. she's not far from you. And I'm wondering, have you seen all the wrestling related hawk tuas? Like there's Iron Sheik memes. I even saw somebody who photoshopped her head on top of um, L.A. Knight's face, and it says "Let me hawk to ya" instead of "talk to ya." <laughs> That's a good one. Great stuff. What do you make of this Hawk Tua going so viral in 2024? It's hard for me to, I don't know what's going on. Are we in the matrix right now? <laughs> so I don't see the, the Silva didn't put up at the bottom of the, this is a, this is a at, Hey, Hey, Conrad. Yeah. Conrad What's, from Huntsville wants to know, Jeff, what do you think of Hawk Tua being right down the road from you? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's to me fascinating. Uh, Conrad, I was, uh, mentioned, I think before we came on, I was in Cleveland this weekend. So flew home. We took the early flight. Anyway, I got to the gym yesterday. Uh, and this is just my strictly my cardio day. Uh, so I did my scrolling. The Vols were on TV. Uh, as we're recording this, they're in the finals tonight, game three against uh, Texas A&M. But anyway, I, I, I guess you could say the hot tour became a a real realization to me <laughs> yesterday. Um, but I I just one of the things that 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 kind of clicked in my brain. No, it didn't click. I wanted it to click. Like what makes something go viral? Like uh, you know, like. What what is the magic? Why why did this go viral? Um, man, they made a country song out of it. You're, I'm probably late to the party, Conrad, but a country song, memes. I saw the Hulk and Animal face paint. Um, I I didn't see the L.A. Night one, but but I mean, I saw several. Um, but what what makes something go viral? And you know, going back, oh gosh, what was that thing where everybody would just start dancing uh, out of nowhere uh, years ago? Oh, the the flash dances, yeah, 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 flash 10, years ago. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the just, but just the different things that just kind of come out of nowhere. And uh, well, over the past weekend, um, I think it was the twenty-five year anniversary of Stone Cold uh, doing his three sixteen phrase or something along those lines. That, that just caught on the different catchphrases, but also just there's so many things. It's like, man, if the, if you could figure out how to make something go viral, of course you'd do it. We would try to do it. And me and me and you both, I'd try to monetize it in shoes, baseball in, um, uh, uh, Russell quest in AEW in my world. Yeah. We, we would manufacture these moments. That's the deal. They can't be manufactured. I guess like who would have called that? Oh, and here's a question I have for you. How old is that interview? Is that something that she just did? It just went viral this month. Yeah. But the hold is the interview. Is it that was posted around? this month. I don't know if she said it four years ago. I'm just saying it just, it was on the internet this month. It's everywhere. Yes. Everywhere. So what makes something go viral? Do you think there is, uh, if you were running TNA, would the hot? I mean, if 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 TNA was still yours, and you're calling the shots, would you have the hot to a girl appear? Work it into a story, absolutely. You'd have to, right? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yes. What, how would you feel hypothetically okay. if your mystery opponent in the Owen Hart tournament was the Hawk to a girl? <laughs> you think you could take her? I, I would have to. I'm fighting to get into the finals, uh, uh, Connie. Do you think it's possible yeah. if you have some internet promos? Because so, not all the promos that AEW produces actually make television a lot of them live on social and youtube do you think it's possible for sanjay dutt or maybe satnam singh to work in a hawk tua into a promo satnam no doubt could. can you imagine satnam hitting the hawk tua yes i can I'm on, I'm on it i'm on it just some things are meant to be you know stay, stay tuned Hey, uh, Magoo over on Twitter wants to know, does Jeff still have in his possession much or any of the old run sheets or booking notes from the TNA days? Yeah, we, we, I mean, and I think we've posted some of those at me, Conrad. Yeah. Actual formats of pay-per-views and notes and, but yes, um, there's a couple of hard drives floating around and, but yeah, they're, they're there. Uh, he also wants to know, did Jeff and Conrad believe in ghosts? And if so, have they had any paranormal experiences? Have you ever, do you believe in ghosts? Have you had a paranormal experience that you know of? I can't say I've had a paranormal experience. Um, I, and I, you know, can you drill down a little more? Like, what do you mean by ghost? Um, do you think a house can be haunted? Do you think a ghost in your house sometimes shuts a cabinet? I don't mean like spiritually. I don't mean like, oh, I can feel my dad's presence. I mean like, yeah. Oh gosh, there's a boogeyman shutting cabinet doors upstairs. I don't. I don't either. Uh, Dave Silva <laughs> says that chair of his has smelled some ghosts. You ain't kidding. <laughs> Probably so. Here's another question from Magoo. He's bringing the good questions on Twitter. If I were to produce a Who Killed TNA documentary, who would be the suspects? Bischoff, Hogan, Dixie, is there anyone we're missing? Sure. Kind of what I said. Bob Carter. Well, what, what, I mean, who killed? Okay. Well, uh, let, me, let me back up. TNA is now still in existence. So you got to throw Lynn Asper, Ed Nordham, Billy Corgan. I mean, just the, the run of people who, I, I guess, if you're just saying suspects and we're having fun here. And hypothetically speaking, I think you got to put all of it uh, out there to, to to kind of peel the layers of the onion back, if you will. Um, and you know, WCW has an active promotion. They never really did any. Vince never gave it his own show, even did he? No, no, so no. It, it was dead in '01. Uh, TNA in 2024, um, uh, they're still rocking. <laughs> so, uh, that's off to them and good luck to them. More importantly, Portillo on Twitter wants to know, is Jeff a Swifty and does he still keep in contact with Taylor? I am a big time Swifty. You know, um, uh, I'd say she's, uh, uh, actively busy doing her world. Uh, she still has roots in the down, but I can't say me and Taylor are texting just kind of like she has a private life and I do too. Well, I mean, here's the reality. Cody doesn't need a babysitter anymore. So <laughs> yes, well you're, said. you're one of the only people I know who hired and fired Taylor Swift. Eat your heart out, Scooter Braun. Uh <laughs> Christopher Duell wants to know where did the gold or I'm sorry, the global force wrestling belts end up? Does he still have them? Uh and you're the belt uh expert, but uh in 2017 when uh, we parted ways, uh, Anthem kept them. I think they remade them. I think there's a. I, I honestly don't know where the whole set is. Uh, which one do I have? I have the next gen. Oh, you got the Cody belt. Yep. Oh, there you go. Yep. I think that may have been Cody's first belt he won post WWE. Oh, wow. Like okay. when he left, you know, that first okay. time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Simon wants to know, in Jeff's expert opinion, what makes the perfect professional wrestler? I know you could talk about this till our next episode, but could you break it down? Give us a cliff notes version of what makes the perfect professional wrestler. 
the most well perfect is there doesn't want to exist, but the most well-rounded is you got to know the basics to tell a story in a match and in a promo. And you got to be willing to work for no fame or no fortune. I said willing to work for no fame. Or fortune. Um, you got to love it that much. I think because you, if you don't have a desire and a passion, you're just not going to, I've just seen too many guys come and go. And if they're, if they're, and I'm not going to say their heart and their head, that sounds so cliche, but you've got to really, really, really want to do this to succeed. Uh, and, and you got to know the basics of how to tell a story, whether you're a heel or a baby face. Rich Henderson wants to know, are you involved in helping AEW secure their new television deal? No. All right. That was pretty fast. Uh, Bobby wants to know, Jeff is the world title, a vehicle for pushing a talent that make it sort of off limits to an established talent. That's from our live studio audience, Bobby. Do you think the uh, world title is a vehicle for making a guy? I mean, we've heard that phrase before that sometimes the, the man makes the title and other times the title makes the man. These days, do you think from an AEW perspective that that's what they're trying to do is use that title to make guys like establish Swerve Strickland as a tippy top guy, for instance? Well, and I want to make sure this is in bold, highlighted, italicized, uh, and underlined uh, print. Creative is subjective. Yes. But the world title, I still believe, and in the pop culture uh, world that we live in, I think it's even more stressed that the Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl, they get a belt. Somebody wins the World Series. Like, like that belt is kind of symbolic of a lot of ways of, 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 of the face. And I think more so now than ever that the guy who's the world champion is carrying the company. It is the face. And I think it is, um, when, when Bobby says a vehicle for pushing a talent, that talent, I believe should be ready to carry the load and push the company. Well, we're hoping that you guys are pushed and compelled to pick up Forbidden Door on pay-per-view. It's happening this Sunday. Jeff Jarrett is going to be watching. I will too. Tickets are on sale now at AEWTIX.com. I'm going to be watching live on pay-per-view. It's Triller TV is my choice. But be sure to catch Jeff on Wednesdays, on Fridays, on Saturdays. Man, there's a, a lot to look forward to with you not only entering the Owen tournament, but winning it and then punching your ticket to become the AEW world champion at Wembley, man, your life is just a movie, man. You're like the, the Forrest Gump of wrestling. You find yourself in the middle of all of it. I love to see it. Connie, I am. I feel incredibly blessed. I mean, who do you know that one day can be down on the dock catching about a six, eight pound catfish. Next thing you know, go up to Cleveland, Ohio, track the voice of the Cleveland Browns, Nathan Segura with the head of a guitar. Come home, pull out Moon's uh, uh, Manscaped trimmer. Say, hey, Queen, can you spare a few minutes? Get my gimmicks for me. <laughs> Pay your dues. And then you hit her with the stroke. I mean, you get the blue chew, the hot tag, the stroke, the whole deal. And then enter the Owen tournament. How about it, buddy? Not enter, win. Win. We're going to speak it into existence. We want Jeff. Easy. Let's get that hashtag going. Hashtag we want Jeff. We might have t shirts available soon for hashtag we want Jeff. Uh, if you haven't already, go hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. It's totally free. And myworldpod.com is your home for all things Jeff Jarrett. So hit the subscribe button, turn on the notifications bell. We're going to make this the summer of no worries, but the summer of one last run. Jeff Jarrett's going to win the world title in Wembley. We're going to speak that shit into existence. I think people care more about him winning the Owen Cup than almost anything else in AEW right now. 
And we need to let people know that. So get that hashtag going. Hashtag we want Jeff. And if you get any heat for that, I just made it up. So send your hate mail to at hey hey it's Conrad. I got thick skin. I'll take care of it. Hashtag we want Jeff. And Jeff will be back next week catching up the good, the bad, and the ugly. I can't wait to talk about Forbidden Door, man. I know oh, we've cool. had a lot of fun and and we've been talking about your wrestling career, but I just want to remind everybody AEW always delivers on pay per view. Thank you. Never have you ever seen a bad AEW pay per view. Yes, some are better than others, but they're all great. And this one is going to be special. It's got a lot of sleeper stuff on there, Jeff. I'm excited to see. So I don't think a decision has absolutely been made, but if it heads that way, I cannot wait to sit down with Renee and I cannot wait to bitch slap RJ for posting, sending you that or whatever it was. But, um, yeah, the, we'll call it the, the pregame show. If we get an opportunity to do that, cause I have, I've, I've looked at this card and, um, AEW always, I've said it many, many times hard to really put a run together uh like they have uh, people they can talk about it man i've experienced it's really hard to put a run together of pay-per-view after pay-per-view so forbidden door is going to be uh one of those that uh new japan cmll has got a big part of it aew forbidden door uh it's one of those unique uh set of circumstances that uh all the guys are going to be swinging for the fences so uh if i'm part of that pregame um I'm excited to do that, to, to sit down and analyze that. Uh, got a busy week. Shoes baseball, Battle of the Sexes is uh, this Friday. Going to be in town. Going to be making some announcements about Capital City Clash coming up uh, in September, our wrestling event up there. And uh, who knows? Maybe catching a catfish or two, Conrad. So I ain't mad at it. We'll see you guys at Forbidden Door. And then next week, right here on My World. Peace. Hey guys, Eric Bischoff here. Now, if you need cash without the controversy, the team at SaveWithConrad.com can help. But don't take my word for it. Hi, my name is Richard Smith. I'm from Moss Point, Mississippi. One of my friends at work said I just been refinancing and my interest rate was 9% and he said he got his for 2.3. So I said, well, maybe I should try. Got a hold of Diane. She kept in touch the whole entire time. We own two houses and we rented one out and my renter quit playing so we gave it back to the mortgage company. And because we did that, we had to wait three years for an FHA loan to go back through. The one thing that, that Conrad said on his podcast was, we'll never tell you no. We might say, not now, but this is what we need to do and we'll make sure we get it done. Well, prime example, three years. And when they say no money out of pocket, they, there's no money out of pocket, they figure it out. But like she was so quick that don't worry about this. I got this one. That's what impressed me the most. My name is Richard Smith and I saved $700 a month to save Conrad.com. And unlike the dirt sheets, these reviews don't lie. With over 1,000 five-star reviews, find out for yourself how much Conrad and his team can save you by checking out SaveWithConrad.com and do it today. NMLS number 32416, Equal Housing Lender, SaveWithConrad.com.